I don't believe Jesus rose from the grave, declares atheist minister Bernie Deller. I am persuaded that Christ the Lord is risen today. Indeed, proclaims Christian counselor Rick Livingston. Our topic today, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Welcome to heaven, where according to the Bible, resurrected believers will dwell forever and ever. And to the council here show. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the pivotal point upon which Christianity stands or falls, according to Bible teacher and author Steve Gregg. I'm Rick Livingston, host and a biblical counselor for 24 years in private practice in Hillsboro, Oregon. The guests in a few moments, humanist minister and atheist Bernie Deller, who will be debating me and chartered financial consultant Robert Baker, who will be moderating the debate between Bernie and me. So we have Bernie with us, who is, well, I'll introduce him in a moment, but Bernie, welcome to the show. Bernie, can you hear me? Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Oh, sure. I was uh, about to have a panic attack. I can hear you just fine. Um, unfortunately, okay. our moderator is not on the line here yet, so I hope he gets on in the next minute or two because I want to introduce him. But meanwhile, Bernie, um, who likes to prove me wrong, <laughs> claims to be a former born-again evangelical Christian, now a secular humanist and a polyatheist, leaving belief in God just three years ago. Bernie has a bachelor's degree from Oregon Institute of Technology in Electrical Engineering, a master's degree from Luther Rice University in Ministry, and works full-time as a computer chip designer. Bernie organizes discussion group meetings on science and religion. He moderates and presents at many local religious debates and discussions. And Bernie is a minister of the Humanist Society under the umbrella of the American Humanist Association, whose slogan is Good Without a God. I'd like to introduce Robert, who's our moderator. He's not here yet, so I will give some introductory info on him. And if he hasn't arrived, we'll take a quick station break and then. Uh, be back, and hopefully I'll be able to get a hold of him. I did talk to him a little bit ago. So anyway, Robert is a chartered financial consultant who works in the financial services industry with a Fortune 500 company. In other words, he's a financial wizard. He's been in the financial services industry for 14 years and in business management positions for 17 years. Robert has a BS in economics, and he is one of my best friends. And I haven't noticed him getting on, so we're going to have to take a station break while I get a hold of him and see if there's a problem. Hopefully, everything will be okay. So we'll be back in just a moment, and then we'll be starting our debate. Well, we got a chance for some classical music here, and we're back on the Council Here show and ready to begin our debate. Uh, Robert, you're with us now, it looks like. Welcome to I'm the here. show. I'm Good. here. Good to have you on. Uh, we did a little introduction just to summarize it uh, without going over it again. Basically, you're our, our uh, resident financial wizard who will be moderating the show. <laughs> Is that pretty cool? Glad to do it. Glad okay. to do it. And at this point, I'm ready to turn over the reins to my good friend, Robert, and he will begin by reading the ground rules. Go ahead, Robert. All right, the ground rules. There are two halves to the debate, first starting with Bernie's printed statement that I will read, and then Bernie will make his opening statement. In the second half, we will do the same except starting with Rick. After the opening statements, there will be some rebuttals between the debaters. Then we will take phone calls for questions from listeners and comments from the debaters. When there are no phone calls, we will return to the rebuttals between the debaters. 
Debaters should stay within their time frames. I will give a 15-second warning for each debater to wrap up his last sentence. After the call-in <clears throat> and or exchanges, each debater is allowed a short summation. A short break divides the first and second halves of the debate. So to start then, I will go ahead and read Bernie's printed statement. Why I don't believe Jesus rose from the grave. There's a very important saying for people who value critical thinking. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Not only do Christians claim that Jesus rose from the grave, but there's a whole lot of baggage that is bundled with that claim. That Jesus is now alive and ruling from heaven, sitting at the right hand of God. And that Jesus is God and existed prior to his birth on earth. Not only is the doctrine that you could believe any competing religious claims that are made in a similar vein, such as Muhammad splitting the moon into two and then rejoining it, Quran 54, 1-30, which would have many witnesses. The story of Jesus rising from the grave is simply Christian mythology, comparable to Mormon mythology, Muslim mythology, Hindu mythology, Greek mythology, etc. And thus, formerly Truman Smith, now known as Bernie Deller, opens with a flourish of unbelief. And Bernie, it's time for your five-minute opening statement. Okay. Um, okay, first off, one thing, can you hear me okay, by the way? Yes. You're fine. Okay. Um, one thing, I, I listened to a debate with William Lane Craig, for example, and one thing he says, and uh, he also refers to Plantica, who's another Christian apologist, they say, you know, uh, with all this evidence, um, it's just that the best, really the best evidence for the existence of God and, and all that is the feelings that you have. You have a special relationship with Jesus. And then the evidence is just kind of like icing on the cake or something to show other people. But you know yourself because of your relationship. So I just want to start off by saying I know um, I, I've had that relationship. I am a former born-again evangelical Christian. I know what it's like to feel like you have a relationship with Jesus. I even uh, talked to Mormons, and they said to pray about the Book of Mormon, and God will give you a burning in the bosom, if it's true. And I actually got that burning in the bosom. But I was saved from Mormonism because of my brain, so I did not become a Mormon. And in the same way, you can be saved also uh, by thinking. Uh, feelings cannot tell you any kind of truth. They can't tell you 2 plus 2 equals 4 or 5. It can't tell you if Jesus rose from the dead or not. It can't tell you if Mormonism is true or not. Feelings are not a valid form of epistemology. That's a way of knowing. And that's a key point to underline and repeat, that feelings are not a valid form of epistemology. That's my first point. My second point is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If I said I have a car, you can believe that. But if I said I had a spaceship that could, uh, capable of intergalactic travel, then you should... You should doubt me, um, because that hasn't even been invented yet, as far as we know. And if I said, furthermore, give me all your money, and we'll go zoom away tonight so you don't die in an asteroid um, collision tomorrow, then I'm asking things of your life, and now you really need evidence. And so, in the same way, the Christian, when he wants you to believe the resurrection, he's asking a lot of things out of your life, so you should really ask for more evidence. Another thing I want to say, this is, uh, this is the third point, that this is a historical claim about whether Jesus rose from the grave or not. Now, a lot of Christians don't know this, but the Gospels are anonymous. Nobody knows who wrote them. Even though they're called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the academics will tell you that truly nobody really knows who wrote them. And the oldest and most reliable manuscript is Mark, and even in Mark, it shows that there was added... Um, added verses to it. For example, the original text ends with them not seeing Jesus rose from the dead, and then there's some verses added. Uh, in the NIV, they have footnotes to tell you that the earliest manuscripts don't have that text. Fourth of all, I want to tell you there's nothing to resurrect. You know, there's this old idea that we have a soul, but we really don't have a soul. All we have is the mind that emerges from the brain. Therefore, it doesn't make sense to even believe that you're going to be resurrected. This, is, uh, this would really help to learn about neurology because then you learn about things such as how the brain operates. It, you know, it operates in parallel and our mind puts together images into one monolithic idea, but there's not one 
person inside of you that figures everything out. That's an old idea called the homunculus. Um, another problem is that when you look at a historical claim, miracles are the least probable. I mean, for example, there's mental magicians like Darren Brown. You can swear he's doing magic. I mean, his magic is real. If he claimed to be God, you might believe it because it's just no way to explain what he's doing. So, you know, how much more something that is so removed, all these old ancient stories. And the last point I want to make, because Rick referred to this, is prophecy. And I want to say, first of all, nobody, as far as prophecy, nobody at the time of Jesus thought that the Messiah would be crucified. So that was a total shocker. Christ. The New Testament is all over that. You know, Jesus is going to return very soon. I could quote you some passages, especially in Revelation. Uh, these things are soon to come. So, so those are my six points. How much time do I have left? About a minute. Okay, so I just want to summarize. Um, I have six points. The first point is um, that no matter what people say, they, they say that they know that this is true because they have a feeling. I'm going to say I have those feelings, and feelings cannot determine truth. Number two, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Number three, this is a historical claim, so you should, tr you should treat it as a historical claim. Four, there's nothing to resurrect because there's no such thing as a soul. There's only the mind, which emerges from the brain. And you can, number five, you can't go back and analyze miracles, just like the magicians have today. We don't know if they're real or, or not because we can't see them and test them. And six, uh, failed prophecies all over the Bible. So I'll leave it there. And that's time. Very good. Rick, uh, rebuttal for five minutes. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I appreciate you being here to uh, help us with this uh, debate and this uh, uh, exercise. And Bernie, I appreciate you being here too. Um, and I've enjoyed our our uh, acquaintanceship over the last uh, couple of years and times on the show. Um, okay. So you started out by saying that the best evidence that uh, some Christians, I guess, and you quoted somebody, was feelings. Um, I don't know if feelings is all of what Christians are about. Uh, some of the greatest minds in the world in history have been Christians like uh, Nicholas Copernicus, St. Francis, uh, Sir Francis Bacon, John Milton, Rene Descartes, Isaac Newton, T.S. Eliot, C.S. Lewis, many fabulous minds, Faraday. I guess the point I'm making there is, is that I don't think these people were just uh, feeler people. I think they also had intelligence and minds. I, I know that many of the uh, institutions of education, uh, MIT, uh, uh, Harvard, uh, some of the other institutions, um, uh, started with uh, Christian uh, influence, and you also uh, have hospitals that begin with that, uh, influence uh, many of the hospitals uh, with some kind of Christian compassionate outreach. So there's a lot of our culture and civilization that's based on people that are just not feelers. But speaking of feelings, I don't think feelings is a bad idea. Um, I know that there's a son and I know I have a hand. Now, I could read a book about it and get an education, go to school. But, you know, frankly, um, the biggest proof is I see it come up every day and go down every evening. Um, so I know that there's a sun. Well, actually, now and then here in Oregon, we miss it. <laughs> oh, well. Um, Robert is further east of us. He probably has more faith in the sun than we Oregonians do. Um, but my hand, it's there every day. And so I see that. Babies, how do they learn? Babies are the geniuses of the world. They progress at such a tremendous rate of intelligence, far beyond ours, and yet a lot of it is their feelings. Feelings are a big educational part of us. And so, yes, if we feel or if we experience a born-again experience in Christ, then that's it. So feelings should not just rule, though, and I agree with Bernie to that point, Feelings should not be the whole sum of our understanding. Feelings are, I like to say, great servants, terrible masters. Bernie claims to be a former evangelical Christian. He had the feelings, he says. I believe he did have some feelings, and unfortunately, that's all they were. Bernie was not a 
Christian. I can say that. Now, that might sound almost arrogant to say that, but the only way that I could say that he wasn't a Christian or, or that he was a Christian is that he's not truly an atheist now. Because how can you believe something doesn't exist if um, you say that you once were friends with that one? Because the definition of a Christian is one who knows God, who knows Christ. Jesus himself said that in John 17, 3. So that's bogus. Um, I hope he becomes one. I hope he has the true experience that goes beyond feeling and into reality. Uh, historical gospels. No one know who uh, knows who wrote them. Uh, that's not true. We don't. I don't have time in this five minutes to get into that in detail. But they're well identified by people and scholars throughout the ages have recognized that. Yes, there are liberal scholars today, particularly the Jesus Seminar that delight in refuting anything and everything of that nature, but that doesn't make them right or counter historical and even present uh, conservative thought. Uh, manuscripts in addition to Mark, I'm not going to have time to refute all of what uh, uh, Bernie had to say, but I'll get a little bit of this, but the manuscript additions in Mark, yes, it's true. There are a few extra things that are in Mark, actually in John also. John uh, beginning of chapter 8, uh, mark the end of chapter 16 at the end. But this has to do with different manuscripts. All I can say is, is that the overwhelming uh, manuscript consistency of the Bible so supersedes the very few copies that we have of Herodotus, Thucydides, and some of the other historians of the Greek and also of the Roman tradition back then. And no one seems to be questioning them. We don't have a soul. All I can say is that that's sad. I, I do feel sad for Bernie to be cut off from that very essence of who he is, because there is something. We all recognize there's something within us that speaks to us, and it's more than just a machine that we're operating. Okay. Um, I, I would like to encourage anyone listening to call in with their questions, and they would, they would call um, area code 760 Two eight three five one two six, and Rick will actually receive those phone calls and manage those. And let's let's get that phone number, number again. Yep, the <laughs> telephone number again is area code seven six zero two eight three five one two six. Okay, now we're going to have a three minute time for a three minute rebuttal. Bernie, you first. Okay, can you hear me? All right. Yes, go right ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I cannot have a regular discussion with Rick because I would really like to have a give and take with him to let him know that feelings are not an epistemology. That is not a way of knowing. There is no way to determine truth by feelings. Uh, this is a very serious uh, point. In critical thinking, there's things called logical fallacies. And to think that you can determine truth of a, of a thing by feelings is called the appeal to emotion. I mean, it's so easy. I mean, he should be able to agree that uh, when a Mormon says, oh, pray to God for a feeling about the Book of Mormon, and that will validate the truth of it, you know that's, you don't accept that because you know that's nonsense. You're, you know your feelings can lead you astray. So it, it, it's, it's ridiculous for people to claim that feelings can determine truth, and yet this is what William Lane Craig has said, and Plantiga, Plantiga has also, he refers to Plantiga. So this is a common Christian uh, fallacy. Yes, I was truly a Christian at one time. I I did feel a relationship. I did feel led by God. Everything that that uh, Rick does, he just doesn't understand what a delusion is. I now see it as a delusion. There's really nothing inconsistent there. He doesn't understand that he is deluded. And the way you know about the, the way you can overpower a delusion is by wisdom. For example, when you see a mirage in the desert, you can be sure that it's a mirage because of your wisdom. So even though your eyes show you something, you know it's not real. And also, the Gospels are, this is another important point, the Gospels really are anonymous. This is what the PhDs from the best seminaries all agree on, as far as I understand it. I mean, this is something that Mark Berman also pounds home. Of course, conservative scholars will disagree with that. That's like saying uh, Mormon scholars will disagree with you about the Book of Mormon. Of course, the Mormon scholars are going to say the Book of Mormon is perfect, you know. So you don't, you don't just talk to the people who promote it. You talk to the academics who, who have the best experience. And the best academics in the Christian world who are Bible scholars um, will admit that the Gospels are anonymous. 
And also, he makes a point about all these all these other documents that are ancient. How come, you know, the Bible has better evidence for it? Why don't we question those other documents? Well, because those other documents don't demand things of your life. And if they do, such as the Hindu scriptures, you don't seem to care about that. You don't seem to look into that. So the reason why this is important to, to look at is because it's so, that the demands are so high that they place on you, that Jesus rose, you know, from the dead and, he demands these things of your life. You need to change your life if you accept this message. You just don't go on like nothing happened. So that's why it's so incredibly important. Um, how much time do I have left? Uh, you're just about up. Ten seconds. Okay. Uh, just one thing to mention. Uh, I was introduced as a polyatheist. That's kind of tongue-in-cheek. That just means that there's a lot of, just like, like a polytheist believes in many gods, there's um, many gods I don't believe in, so I'm a polyatheist. Okay, Rick, um, time for three-minute rebuttal. Okay, I'll try to get in some poly ideas here. Um, <laughs> well, uh, Bernie wants to talk about feelings here, so I guess, you know, I'll get into that. Um, I'm a marriage counselor, marriage and family counselor, personal counseling, but I do a lot of marriage counseling, and I'm pretty focused on the area of love. I think love is important. And while love can't be proved any more than God can be proved, it's sad if a person denies that love, since love is a feeling, um, doesn't exist. Um, I think that there's more to it than just feeling. So um, a person perceives the love of his spouse, uh, if he's married, um, uh, based on some of his feelings. And there are emotional components to that. We do pick up on things. In fact, our soul is involved in that. But feelings are also in the physical realm. We have five senses, and we can perceive things from that, too. By the way, as the person smiles, the different things that they do. So we pick up things from perceptions also. And then also there's other evidences. For one thing, other people's opinions. And we can pick up things from that. We can see that something exists because there's um, confirmation from other people. There's accountability there. And uh, that also helps confirm what we uh, believe uh, is true love. Um, that's why friends, parents, family uh, help present something that can uh, uh, bring about a better picture of love. Also, the things we observe in a person's life, their faithfulness and reliability, uh, things that we appreciate about them, that they're very supportive of us and they stick with us. And the fellowship that we have with that person. Uh, in Christian language, uh, with God, it would be the koinonia that we experience. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot that comes into play. Is feelings involved? Yes, but it's a lot more than feelings. Um, now, Bernie said that I'm deluded. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I'm glad you recognize that. I believe that on Judgment Day, we'll all be delivered from some of the heresies and the false ideas that we had, and um, I'm going to appreciate that washing. I hope I get as much washed out in this life as possible. Maybe Bernie will help me with some of that. It does sound a little bit religious in a way, because the idea of samskara in the Hindu uh, uh, tradition is that there's not really sin. It's all delusion. There's just the big illusion and that's the illusion of desire, and the Buddhists go with that also. So I'm not sure what to make out of that. It's easy to say, I guess I could say, Bernie, you're deluded, but I'm not going to say that. Um, I'll let him figure that out. So there are fine minds uh, that come from some of the uh, seminaries that uh, don't agree with what Bernie's saying. Some of the greatest minds of the 20th century, like Karl Barth and C.S. Lewis, would see it differently. Thanks, uh, gentlemen. Um, we've got about 30 minutes until the break, and I want to remind listeners that they can and hopefully will call in. It's area code 760-283-5126. Please call in with uh, your questions or comments. That telephone number again is area code 760-283-5126. And um, now, gentlemen, we will go into... Um, rebuttal and based on probably how many calls we get if we don't have many calls i think i might stretch the time out from one minute to maybe two minute rebuttal so bernie um you are up 
Uh, how much time is it? One minute or two minutes? Let's let's go with two minutes for right now. To, if, unless we get some calls, I'll make sure. Well, minutes, but okay. I minutes. mean, yeah. I mean, just going back to the saying, I, I I said that feelings are not a a method of epistemology. Epistemology means a way of gaining knowledge. Um, and Rick responded back, "Well, hey, I feel love. I feel sorry for if you can't feel love. Love has nothing to do with determining truth. You can't you can't determine if an equation." The mathematical equation is correct by feelings. You can't determine if the Book of Mormon is the Word of God by feelings. And in the same way, you can't tell if Jesus rose from the grave by feelings. You just can't. It's not a way of knowing. It's, it's a very simple point. And to believe that you can is a logical fallacy called appeal to emotion. And there may be other fallacies involved with it, too, but it, it should be obvious that you cannot determine truth. And... You know, like I said, uh, th- this is actually something that, you know, Rick said this is one of the one of the witnesses that he has, among other things. And I'm just saying that is not a way of knowing anything. And then just as far as being deluded, I was once deluded, yeah. I mean, just like I said, I, it, it's like seeing a mirage out there. I realized I was deluded, and I, I believe that you are deluded. That's not name-calling. If, if you think you, if we're in a desert and you're very thirsty – and you see a mirage, and I say, hey, you're deluded, that's not name-calling. I'm just trying to tell you there's a situation there that you're seeing things that don't exist. And that's what I'm saying. When a Christian believes in God, they're seeing and feeling things that don't exist. It's a delusion. So it's not name-calling. It's just you know, trying to state the way, what's going on there. Rick, two minutes. Yeah, um... I'm going to give my two minutes, and then we have somebody on the line, so that way we each get our two minutes, and then here we go. So uh, Bernie said love has nothing to do with truth. Um, I just wonder then if being married is um, a a delusion also, because if love has nothing to do with truth, then really why would one get married if there's no love? Because if there's love is a not a function of truth or if the love isn't truthful or so that something to that degree. Anyway, somehow this seems to be incomprehensible to me. The highest values we have have to do with both love and with truth. So I, I, I guess I, that goes past me. Maybe we can pick that up after the phone call. Um, I want to make two more footnotes. One, I'm going to bring some very, um, uh, uh, concrete ev- type of evidence uh, when it's my turn, when I state my positions. So we're not going to just go by what he's calling feeling. I wrote a poem uh, a while ago, and here's a little stanza out of it. Before I met you, I was not alive. The sun would rise, the sun would set, my eyes saw nothing but the empty azure shell of my existence, nature's clever lie. The planet spun nowhere who needed hell. This is a state of someone who has not been resurrected, in other words, born again. And Christians are all raised from the dead. In order to be a Christian, Bernie would have had to have been resurrected, because if he wasn't raised from the dead spiritually, truly spiritually, not a feeling, but the spirit, which goes beyond feeling, then I'm not sure what he experienced. I feel sad for him. Okay, I don't need the rest. So anyway, um, I want to get to the phone call here, because we have someone on the line, so I'm going to bring them on. And then he can address either Bernie or me, and then we'll both make comments. And, uh, Robert, you can um, <laughs> referee us. <laughs> okay, on. so we have someone else on the line. And can you give you us your first name and what state you're calling from? My name is Herb, calling from Oregon. Okay, Herb, go ahead. You can ask either one of us or both of us a question. And Robert, it's well, yours um, now. I'm a Christian, but I would—I really don't go much at all on the idea of feelings as being a, a source of of uh, reliable belief. Um, so I, I would disagree with uh, the, the Christian speaker to some extent on that. Um, I think I think it is very important that the uh, historicity of the events of Jesus' resurrection are. Uh, are um, recognized because that's it's not something that I feel he's risen, but rather that he historically was uh, uh, rose. And in that regard, 
uh, I would ask um, uh, Bernie, if he's a neighbor, um, how do you uh, deal with the, uh, the evidence of all of these disciples and witnesses uh, making that uh, statement and, uh, and being willing and almost to a man uh, and woman dying, being willing to die for it, uh, with no one ever recanting it? Um, that that uh, it's seen that that would be a strong uh, evidence of the uh, of the conviction that that they had that this that he really did historically rise. That's all. Thank I you. Would like to thank you, Herb. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Bernie, you want to respond? Yeah. Uh, as far as witnesses dying for their testimony, this is something that Robert Price has mentioned. And I think Bart Ehrman also that they said basically there is really no good testimony on that. It's just. Uh, hearsay and gossip, basically, it's, it's you know, probably secondhand. It's just there's no, they're not reliable um, sources for that. And also, as far as the witnesses, um, you know, the the earliest gospel is Mark, and that was written something like, I believe it was 30 or 40 years after this uh, event of the resurrection, which is claimed. And then the other um, synoptic gospels, basically um, collaborated with that, basically uh, took it and modified it and worked with it. So basically those, they're all kind of similarities. Uh, some of them are amped up. They, you know, um, one reason why they believe this is because Mark kind of has a matter of fact, a lot of statements on a lot of things and the other ones amp it up, amp up the story. And you can also see some of the discrepancies. And so here's the oldest, the oldest gospel, which is the most accurate, doesn't even have an account of Jesus being seen, um, you know, by the end of it. It's just, it's just the body's gone, and there's some man who appears to Mary and talks to Mary, and doesn't, and it, it doesn't say it's an angel or anything. It just says a man and says Jesus is not here. And then, when you, then, and then you see a footnote in the NIV that says, hey, the following verses aren't in the oldest uh, manuscripts, which is the more accurate manuscripts. So right there it shows you there's added stuff in the Bible that's not part of the original. So you can ask yourself, why is there added stuff in the Bible when they know this stuff is not in the original? I mean, it's obvious this is not in the original text, but they can't take it out because then there'd be a big scandal. They'd say, like, hey, why are these verses missing from the Bible? So. All right, Rick. I'll leave it there. Was I talking too long? No, you did fine. Rick, two minutes. Okay. Um, Boy, um, I I forgot the name. What was your name again? Uh, Caller from... Herb. Okay, Herb. Um, yeah, I've been so busy writing notes that I uh, <laughs> can forget easily. Um, I would agree with you that by themselves, feelings are not reliable, and I don't uh, believe in the resurrection of the dead because of Jesus Christ, because I felt it uh, in that sense. Um, that's not the basis of my belief. So your line of questioning, I think, is good, and I will be getting to that when I present my position, which will be in about I don't know. Well, whenever uh, this half is over, I'll be presenting my evidence. I'm responding to what Bernie's saying, and he claims to think that that's what we have as feelings. But I don't think feelings are completely unreliable. It's just it works in tandem with intellect, with with um, external evidence and number of things. The death of the disciples um, has been accepted um, throughout Christian history. Um, by great minds, minds like Augustine um, and other great minds uh, throughout uh, Christian history and has been um, reported that way. And so I think that there's a pretty good case for it. In fact, one of the disciples we know of right in the gospel or in the book of Acts, um, uh, the brother of the apostle John James, was martyred uh, very early on, and it's recorded somewhere around Acts chapter 11 or 12, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. So I think we have some evidence there. As far as Mark, he wasn't written. It wasn't written 40 years afterwards. It was probably written somewhere between 25 to 30 years afterwards. But Mark was a close friend of Peter, and there's uh, quite a bit of. Are we about done with my time? Yeah, 15 seconds. Okay. Um, well, I have more, but maybe I'll get it in later. We'll see what happens. Um, did you want to address anything with Herb or with um, Bernie, or where do you want to go with this? Herb, did you have another question? Well, I, I would like to uh, follow up that discussion um, about the witnesses. 
Um, the beginning of the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke is very clear. The word that's used there for the people that he, he wanted to interview were the people who had, in that culture, would memorize things word for word, and they were starting to die. And that's why he uh, uh, felt it necessary to, to record the, the, what their, their witness was. So I think you have a very uh, clear example in the beginning of the book of Luke that uh, the witnesses were there, that they were uh, interviewed, and that uh, they were no longer going to simply rely on an oral tradition. They had to put this down into, uh, into writing. So I think it's, uh, it's, that's, uh, the, the witnesses were alive when Luke, uh, when Luke wrote, and he recorded what they said. But that's all. Thank you, Herb. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I have a comment on that. Yeah, um, so there's, I, I think there's a matter of what they call intellectual honesty here, and, and the church kind of corrupted this, I think, with people. You know, just the very words saying the Gospel of Luke is not intellectually honest because it's anonymous, and nobody knows who even wrote that. And what Bart Ehrman says is that these stories were, were passed on verbally by person by person by person, Two person like a game of telephone for the purposes of converting each other and at some point it was written down by some guy who's pretty good uh, with Greek uh, the, you know the, uh, the original disciples would have spoken uh, Aramaic and they're probably illiterate there's even a passage that says you know these these men I think it was Peter and John uh, Peter and somebody that they were uh, unlearned you know they, they were unlearned and uneducated people so they're probably illiterate um, so anyway yeah, that there was a lot of verbal copying back and forth, and it finally got down put, put down in the words. But who wrote that? I think it's dishonest to actually say that's the Gospel of Luke because nobody knows who wrote it. Rick, rebuttal. Um, well, there's a lot to say, but um, Luke was uh, very specific. It wasn't just the title of the book, uh, uh, the Book of Luke, but it says, um, yeah, where, where is it? Um, inasmuch as many, okay, um, I'm just pulling this up here. Um, maybe it's in the book of Acts. Um, I'm getting a little lost, but, uh, the caller, Herb, is very accurate. Um, he goes to great pains to identify who he is, that he is a doctor. He's mentioned also in the book of Acts recorded by Paul and, um, you have these tedious lists that Luke comes up with. He's not only a doctor, he's a good historian. He's, it's considered the most historic book in terms of uh, attempting to be historical accurate as opposed to Matthew that is more of a teaching book. It, it's more organized that way. Not that it's not as historically accurate, but Luke pay, takes great pains with history. Both of those books have tedious long lists of inspired boredom, that is, lists of history and um, one person after another after another being named, and the reason why is to promote the historicity of that. So I think that you know to say that uh, you know to say that that uh, that it's not accurate. Uh, I, I don't understand that. Then in the beginning of First John, John himself, who was his closest disciple, said that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. I guess that's a feeling he had. He heard that's a um, a physical feeling, which we have seen with our eyes, that's another feeling, a physical feeling, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, there's another feeling, concerning the word of life. They experienced, I guess the question I would ask of my listeners is this, when we really zero in on the resurrection, when I start beginning the arguments for that, um, are you going to believe John, who heard, saw with his eyes, along with many others with him, and even touched with the hands and leaned his uh, 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 head on the bosom of Jesus at the Last Supper. Um, concerning the word of life, are we going to believe that, or are we going to believe um, some seminarians uh, that have a particular agenda and also Bernie's position? Time's up, Rick. Okay, so um, I wonder if we want to entertain another question from Herb. Rick, that might be your call, or if you guys want to go into more rebuttal to each other. It's, uh, we've got about 16 minutes left in this half. 
Uh, we don't Nobody's have another caller. If Herb has something else to add, otherwise um, I've got more to rebut. I'll, and I'll stop. Probably I'll, 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 I'll stop. Thank yeah, you, Herb. Let's, let's tie in another caller because we might get more callers yeah. after that. Thanks, thanks Herb, for yeah. joining okay. us. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right, um, Bernie. It's your time for a couple minutes. Well, I already talked on this one. Um, I thought you said we have another. Co- I already, already, I talked first, right? Yes. So, um, I, Rick, do we have another caller? Not yet, and I, I'm here to respond to Bernie during the first half here. So, um, unless if he doesn't have anything to say, there's more response oh, I have to some of the oh, things he said. I'll Bernie, leave it up to him. Bernie, it's okay, your turn. I got You've got two minutes. I thought you said. Now, I if thought we you go one minute, at, if we go one minute, then we will be going back and forth, but we'll be doing it in an equal paradigm. So that's the idea of the one minute. So okay, let's go to one minute, Bernie. You got one minute. Okay. Um, I, on one debate I saw with Robert Price, he wrote the uh, Incredible Shrinking Man, I believe. He also did the Bible Geek. Uh, he, you know, he's a liberal guy on the Jesus Seminar, but. Anyway, he's saying, uh, like William Lane Craig, when he gives his, you know, he says, oh, all these New Testament scholars uh, believe so-and-so or whatever. Um, you know, he's just talking about these are the conservative, conservatives. There's, there's a huge difference between um, people that are biased and people that have, like, academic PhDs. I mean, for example, you, there's seminaries like Yale and I think Harvard. Some of these schools, they have really high standards. You know, you have to learn a couple different languages and all that. And then there's all these little theological schools. Um, You know, for example, Dallas Theological Seminary, Robert Price said, you know, over there, they they learn so much about Greek and Hebrew and all this stuff, but what's all this training for? I mean, they can't even come up with something new because they'll get shot down as a heretic. They have to fit right there in their tight little theological circles. So... So anyway, my point is, is like, what what are these academics are saying? You, you, the church is really kind of ignorant of things they teach in church. For example, they'll teach in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John wrote this, but the academics say John was written around the year 90 or so. Um, up. Mark up, is by far the earliest manuscript and the best and the best. I mean. Okay, Rick, you've got a minute, Rick. Well, I had a pastor that once said that seminaries sometimes can be cemeteries for people who have faith. Um, I wouldn't make a blanket statement that way, but uh, in some cases, and uh, uh, Bernie referred to the Jesus Seminar, they are the, probably the most radical anti-Christian group uh, in the world. They have some PhDs there. Um, it is possible to be an educated fool. I have a master's degree. That doesn't make me smart. Uh, living the life in the faith of Christ, um, I prefer wisdom over knowledge. Uh, knowledge can sometimes very much, as the wise man said, puff up, um, but love builds up. Okay. Uh, Bernie can have my 15 seconds. Okay, Bernie. Well, yeah, I mean, Rick, if, you, if let's say, for example, you argue with a Mormon and some Mormon says, you know what, this is what the Mormon scholars say about the Book of Mormon. You're going to say, like, do you think I care about what the Mormon scholars are saying about the Book of Mormon? Seriously? Do you care what the Mormon scholars are saying about the Book of Mormon, Rick? I'm taking it you want me to respond to that. Yeah. Um, I would care if there was any truth to it. Um, I've studied some Mormonism. Um, I want to take them seriously because they are significant, you know, as a movement. Uh, They're a large movement that started uh, in our country uh, close to 200 years ago. Um, And so I read some of their materials. I read criticism of those materials. And when I weighed it, I found a lot of it was rather wanting, you know. So um, I do have some ideas that they have contradicted the scriptures, and they hold the Book of Mormon to be superior to the scripture, and I have a problem with that. And also so many inconsistencies. Okay, Bernie? My only point is to evaluate the Bible like you would the Book of Mormon. Don't give it a special privilege just because you're a Mormon or <laughs> because you're in America. Okay, uh, I do want to address that. Um, I will admit that I have had prejudice, but my prejudice was not the way you might think. I grew up in the 1950s and then into the 60s in a synagogue. To us, the equation of a Christian was 
sometimes we thought was like a Nazi. We thought that the Christians in Europe supported the Pope, would not oppose uh, what was happening there. So we were, fam- we were familiar with the anti-Semitism. We were familiar with prejudiced Christians that would say that uh, we were Christ uh, killers. So uh, when I approached Christianity, um, there was a lot of that. And then also living in California and visiting the Bay Area, there were um, some pretty radical Jesus freaks that tried to shove things down my throat. So I saw formal religion through some of the uh, more more formal realms where I saw hypocrisy and I saw fanaticism. So I did not approach Christianity. Uh, It was only when I saw a group of people that were really living the faith that my mind and my heart opened up. Bernie. Okay. Let me, let me, uh, I think there's some obvious myths in the Bible. For example, um, I think Carl Sagan said this to somebody. He says, you know, in Acts, it talks about, uh, Jesus ascended up into heaven. You know, he physically rose up and went beyond the clouds. He goes, did you know that if he's traveling at the speed of light, he still hasn't escaped the Milky Way galaxy yet? You know, the Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter. That means it takes 100,000 uh, light uh, years at the speed of light to go across the entire Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way galaxy is one of hundreds of billions of galaxies. So it's like, where is Jesus going? But if you see this through the ancient and ignorant eyes, they thought, hey, you know, heaven's up in the sky. So when Jesus ascends, he's going to physically go up there. So this is an example of, you know, obvious myth in the Bible. They got taught writing according to their ideas. And there's a lot of other myths, too, like, you know, if you get bit by a snake, you won't die. Um, And these dead people came out of the graves when Jesus died on the cross. Um, Okay, time's up. So, I mean... Rick? Okay, um, Bernie... There's a modern term, so I won't be ancient and ignorant here. It's called ethnocentrism. And I think what you just said kind of has that, that flavor in it. And you might take a look at that. When you say ancient and ignorant, it's kind of like those ancients are ignorant. There's, there's a concept that all knowledge and today we, we're really where it's happening. And that's ethnocentrism. It's basically pride and arrogance. And we have to be careful about that. I've noticed that that is common with many intellectuals. Also, you asked a good question. Where is Jesus? Where was Jesus going? That is the question. That is a good one. And it's not ancient and ignorant for us to ask basic questions like, where did we come from? Which science has never been able to answer that because that's not in the realm of science. Science has a great place, but that's not one of them. That's metaphysics, not physics, and that's the realm of philosophy and theology, and that gets into Bernie? the soul and the spirit. Bernie? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, the ancients were ignorant compared to us. I mean, they, they thought things like they had this geocentric view, like the entire universe revolved around the Earth, and then, you know, we got the heliocentric where we thought, okay, well, everything goes around the sun, and then we realized, oh, wow, the sun is just one star of billions in the galaxy and there's billions hundreds of billions of galaxies you know they believed in a flat earth they didn't know anything about dna of course they were ignorant i mean that's obvious they were ignorant and they wrote according to that ignorance and now we can bust them we can say aha you have a made-up story because you thought heaven was up in the sky and now we know it's not there because we have spaceships that have gone up there we have a rover on mars there is no heaven up there Rick. So I'll leave it out there for you. Well, I'm glad that uh, we're not in an ignorant day. We're in a day where we know that abortion is a good thing. We're in a day where we recognize that marriage has been uh, poorly defined through uh, several millennia. We're in a uh, day where we're no longer ignorant of the fact that God doesn't exist. I don't think today necessarily things are better. I don't think that our society is better than it was even 40, 50 years ago. Um, where when I was growing up, uh, I didn't even know what marijuana or meth or heroin or any of those things were until I was about 18. Uh, And I grew up in a big city high school. But today, well, anyway, we've gone from chewing gum to shooting guns in the schools. So just because progress moves us forward 
doesn't mean it really does. Sometimes it's a backward thing. But speaking of progress, remember, um, it's science was developed by a Christian culture and with many Christians at the vanguard. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton was a man of the Bible, thoroughly, totally believed it and taught it. Bernie? Well, yeah, it's kind of ridiculous that, yeah, Christians maybe did pioneer science, but how pathetic now that so many um, reject modern science, especially evolution. But then you, you brought up morality, which is a whole different subject. Let me bring up something new about the soul. I said there's no such thing as a soul. There's just the mind that emerges from the brain. This goes to the question, where do you think the soul comes from? How does it, how does, it does it come at conception? Because there's a problem. Identical twins start off as one person, and then at some point, it divides into two. So does that mean the original one had two souls, if it was at conception? And then there's also the opposite, where there's a chimera, where there's two separate fetuses, and at some point they join into one fetus. So does that mean each one had a half a soul to begin with, if, there, if you get a soul there? And if a baby dies, is it a baby forever in heaven? Or if a senile person, is it forever senile in heaven? All of these things show the impossibility of how does it make sense to even believe in a soul. There is no such thing as a static um, kind of personality or person like the soul idea. It, the whole thing doesn't make sense when you look into it. But when Thanks, you look Bernie. at it, Time's up. Okay. Okay, you guys got one minute each, and then we're going to go into two-minute summation. So, Rick, your turn. Well... I, I think, you know, with all due respect to Bernie, and I know he's very sincere in his beliefs, I, I, I trust him with that. But when he says that Christians reject modern science, that is just like the most ridiculous thing I can hear that he has said so far. Um, well, or at least close to it. Um, no, that's not true. Um, we ex accept it in millions of ways. Myself, not very scientific, I embrace science. Um, I embrace the technology. This radio show would not be produced unless I affirmed so much of the science that's involved in it. As far as babies and what happens to them or senile people, yes, I can believe in impossible things. My existence is impossible. Your existence, the odds of us being able to live with all the scientific configurations that are necessary for that is just impossible. But we take so much on faith anyway. All of us do. You do too. Okay, Bernie. Okay, my thing about the babies is not saying it's impossible. I'm saying it's inconsistent. It doesn't make sense. Are you, are you going to be a baby forever in heaven and all that? And as far as modern science, as far as I know, you reject human evolution. Human evolution is a fact that we evolved from other animals. That is a scientific fact nowadays, and you don't accept that. And you probably support a whole bunch of Christians that don't accept that. Um, so, I mean, this is a whole movement, a Christian movement that is anti-science or, or, or maybe scientifically ignorant for not being able to accept the fact that humans evolved from other animals. And, of course, those Christians who do believe it, like Francis Collins, they're, they're, this, you know, they're, they're educated and they're smart, but uh, it's, I don't know, it's amazing to me that you say you stand up for science, but yet you don't accept the fact of evolution. Okay, because gentlemen, that has got... happened is a fact. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, it's time for your two-minute uh, summation. So, and we are actually going to start with Bernie first, and then Rick will conclude. Okay, I'll just summarize my points. My first point is uh, a lot of Christians say that they know, you know, even forget about all the evidence because the evidence, you can't prove it either way. Bottom line, I know it's all real because I feel Jesus in my heart. And I want to say, I know that feeling. I've been there. I've done that. And I now see it as a delusion. And the second thing is, is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. When somebody says, here's a really crazy claim and it's going to and it requires you to, to live your life in a certain way, then you really, really need to ask for what kind of evidence you have. And if it's just a bunch of miracle stories and gossip, why would you throw yourself, your life away for that? The third one is uh, the resurrection is a historical claim, so you should look at it historically. And, for example, learn like the, the Gospels are written anonymously and how they're, the synoptic uh, Gospels are copied from each other, and Mark is the... Uh, best and earliest, and it already has obvious examples of added stuff from the original. 
Number four, there's nothing to resurrect because there is no soul. Like I, like I mentioned, um, you know, it, how does the soul come in? I mean, the more you think about the soul, the more you understand how nonsense the whole idea is. There's just a mind that emerges from the brain. There's no supernatural soul. Um, another point is, is that historical miracles are impossible to figure out if they're true or not. I mean, there's magicians all the time that do things and claim things. And uh, even now people say they talked to Jesus and they saw have a vision of Jesus. And, you know, they probably didn't. There's a lot of crazy stories about people that said they saw Jesus and all these weird things. 15 he did. seconds, Bernie. Okay, and the other thing is, is the prophecy. Nobody prophesied Jesus was going to die, the Messiah was going to die. That just happened. And then the most famous failed prophecy of all is the soon return of Christ. Total failure. 2,000 years and still counting. Okay. Well, thank you, Bernie. Uh, Rick, it's time for your two-minute summation. Bernie makes statements, but he doesn't really back them up with any facts. Um, he says that evolution is a fact, according to the science, and that we aren't scientific if we don't believe that. According to the actual definition of a fact, evolution has never been proved as a fact, uh, according to the very scientific method. Uh, Bernie has not proved that there's no soul. He just makes it as an assumption. So it's just a pre presumption, and that's it. A friend of mine named Steve Garrett, he gave some definitions that I thought were really germane here. He said, God, the creator, the I am, who requires nothing but desires to give everything to his most precious creation. Man, capable of so much in tandem with the creator, but sadly confused to believe he can do it all by himself. The accuser, the detractor, cunning with words and ruthless in power, usurped from the rightful heirs. The story, a tale told by an idiot repeated eternally through time until the original message has been lost, buried beneath the rubbish heaped upon the name of I Am. The Redeemer, born from above to begin rebirth of creation, life overflowing, joy inexpressible, peace beyond understanding, proclaiming a message of hope. And finally, the mission. Return the creation to the Creator, the prodigal to the Father, the wayward to the path of life and hope. My friend Steve Garrett just happened to post that today, and I liked it so much I got his permission, and God bless 15 you. Fifteen seconds. Fifteen seconds. That's right. it. I'm done. You okay. can have the rest. All right. All right, gentlemen, we are actually at uh, the break, so um, Rick, do you want to take over and tell us how that's going to work? All right, and I'd like to uh, remind callers uh, that they can and hopefully will call in and ask their questions and make comments. Okay, now we're going to have Rick's printed statement, which I'll read. While I respect Bernie's sincere belief that Jesus did not rise from the dead, my critical thinking skills along with science, faith, based not on feeling but on fact, history, and my personal experience of the Holy Spirit all persuade me that Christ the Lord is risen today. Indeed, look at the multitude of fulfilled prophecies regarding Christ. See the mathematical impossibility of random chance for an intricate cell on a hand to exist, let alone all the other interconnected factors from the functions of fingers through atmospheric balance to gravitational pull of the sun upholding us. Note the overwhelming witnesses, the witness of the apostles willing to die not for a belief, but an event they witnessed, let alone historic verification. And hopefully, behold your life lived by the same Spirit that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead, dwelling in you. All right, um, Rick, you have five minutes. There's no way I can tackle all of those, but I'm going to start with the historical evidence. So, um, Bernie made a reference to William Lane Craig, who's a research professor of philosophy at Talbot the School of Theology, um, anyway, which is one of your seminaries. And he says, virtually all scholars who deal with the resurrection, whatever their school of thought, assent to these three truths. We will see that the resurrection of Christ is the best explanation for each of them individually. Those three evidences is the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances, and the origin of the Christian faith. So starting with the empty tomb, first the resurrection was preached in, only, in the same city 
where Jesus had been buried shortly before Jesus' disciples did not go, um, or Jesus' disciples did not go to an obscure pl uh, place where no one had heard of Jesus to begin preaching about the resurrection, but instead began preaching in Jerusalem, read Acts chapter 2 and, so, and onward. Second, the earliest Jewish arguments against Christianity admit the empty tomb. In Matthew 28, 11 to 15, there is a, evident, a reference that is made to the Jews' attempt to refute Christianity uh, from being to saying that the disciples stole the body. The Toledoth Jesu, a compilation of early Jewish writings, is another source according to this. Third, the empty tomb account in the Gospel of Mark is based upon a source that originated within seven years of the event it narrates. This places the evidence for the empty tomb too early to be legendary and makes it much more likely that it is accurate. Fourth, the empty tomb is supported by the historical reliability of the burial story. New Testament scholars agree that the burial story is one of the best established facts about Jesus. One reason for this is because of the inclusion of Joseph of Arithmea as the one who buried Christ. Joseph was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, a sort of Jewish Supreme Court. People on the, on, in this ruling class were simply too well known for fictitious stories about them to be pulled off in this way. Then there's the resurrection appearances. Okay, there's the evidence that Jesus' disciples had real experiences with one whom they believed was the risen Christ. This is not commonly disputed today because we have the testimony of the original disciples themselves that they saw Jesus alive again. And you don't have to believe in the reliability of the Gospels to believe this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, Paul records an ancient creed concerning Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection appearances that is much earlier than the letter in which Paul is recording it, which was around 57 AD. It is generally agreed by critical scholars that Paul received this creed from Peter and James between three to five years after the crucifixion. Ten people would not all give their lives for something they know to be a lie. The hallucination theory is untenable because it cannot explain the physical nature of the appearances. I read from 1 John chapter 1 a little bit earlier about John. The disciples record eating and drinking with Jesus as well as touching him. This cannot be done with hallucinations. Second, it is highly unlikely that they would have all had the same hallucination. Hallucinations are highly individual and not group projections. Since the disciples could not have been lying or hallucinating, we have only one possible explanation left. The disciples believed that they had seen the risen Jesus because they really had seen the risen Jesus. Do I have time for the origin of Christian faith or am I out of time? Uh, you've got a minute. Okay. Could it have been Christian influences, the origin of Christian faith? Uh, since the belief in the resurrection was itself the foundation for Christianity, it cannot be explained as the later product of Christianity. But what about pagan influences? First, it has been shown that these mystery religious had no major influence in Palestine in the first century. Second, most of the second. sources which contain parallels originated after Christianity was established. Third, most of the similarities are often apparent and not real, a result of sloppy terminology on the part of those who explain them. Well, I have more to say, but I guess, Time's up. you know, the, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, Bernie, five minutes. Okay. Um... I'm trying to read in the uh, sorry I'm in my, my car and it's kind of dark. Okay. Oh, so as far as uh, there's all these stories about the empty tomb appearances and all this stuff and all these experts that William Lane Craig refers to. Again, a lot of these experts who would validate that the resurrection. That's like asking a bunch of Book of Mormon experts about the Book of Mormon. Of course, they're going to do that. I mean, you got to you got to talk to people who are really academic Bible scholars and not just conservative ones. And the conservative ones aren't going to say that that's the best explanation. Um, he, he talked about the book of Matthew, which, you know, is a, is a copy based on Mark, and Mark is about 30 years after the event. Um, that's one thing I mentioned earlier. Mentioning the Corinthians, which is supposed to be referring to an earlier creed, uh, that's a sign that the, the creed was institutionalized, which means, there, you know, the people got together and they came up with 
with their with their doctrines. Again, this is all kind of uh, just nothing was really written down, and, and it was all kind of verbal. And finally, somebody wrote wrote something down. And he said people wouldn't give their lives for this. Well, again, there's no good evidence. This is where the the viewer has to do their own research and look at what the evidence is for this claim that people gave their lives for the story. Because from the experts I've heard, there is no evidence for that. It's just a claim that's made over and over in church. Um, he says you can't do hallucinations like touching people or whatever. Um, Robert Price gave a story of a, a woman he met who said she saw Jesus, and Jesus asked her what she wanted, and she asked to live to like 100 years old like a lot of people in her family. And she said, I want more. I want you to write this down and, 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 with a pencil. And he did, supposedly. Of course, he said he didn't see it. He didn't look for it. He wasn't there. But there are people who claim these kind of things. Now, in Acts, it talks about Jesus ascending up in the heavens physically. So I'm saying right there, that's evidence the story is made up. Because nowadays, no Christian is going to say heaven is literally above the clouds. That's what they believed then. But nowadays, they would say, oh, heaven's in a different dimension. But back then, they thought it was literally up there in the sky. And we, we don't think that anymore. As far as all these Christians, uh, you know, the, the resurrection was the core. Who knows what the core was? There's so many different... Christians that burned out the other Christians as heretics. I mean, I, I came from a Catholic family originally. I grew up as a Catholic family. And a lot of the Catholics say, if you look at the oldest uh, beliefs, they all believe in the literal presence in the Eucharist. In other words, when the priest does his incantation, that wafer is literally Jesus, even though it doesn't look like it and taste like it. But you're eating that wafer. You're literally eating Jesus. And they, they go to the oldest manuscripts, oldest documents, everything. So are you going to now become a Catholic and believe in the Eucharist because that's what the earliest Christians believed? Uh, you know, you got to ask yourself if you're going to be consistent, you know. And, of course, you're going to say, well, of course I can't believe that wafer is literally Jesus. That's nonsense. But they, they actually used ancient science called accidents and substance to try to explain it. And, of course, it's nonsense now. That's, I think it's called Aristotelian physics or something like that. They, they were saying that the appearance could be different on the outside than the substance. And, of course, we know that's nonsense now. So, yeah, there's a lot of call, all kinds of weird beliefs, but it's hard to say what people believed back then because they killed each other over their communities to try to get the same beliefs in the community. So I'll leave it with that. Okay, Rick, um, three minutes. Okay. Um Okay, so I concluded from what Bernie said that conservatives are not academic. Um, I guess when I look at history, I see something different. When I look at brilliant minds today, I see something different. Even the guy that debated uh, Bernie a few months ago is a brilliant man and held his own very well with Bernie, much better debater than myself, I would say. Um, and the man uh, who um, is conducting the Truth Project, another very – uh, cogent and uh, academic man, much more than myself. Uh, there, are, there's plenty of that around. I've I've met many of those guys, and there's many more that are probably more brilliant than I haven't. Matthew is not a copy of Mark. There's even uh, apparent contradictions between them, which are cited as proof that the Bible's not accurate. Actually, it's more proof that there's not collusion, which actually verifies that. Uh, the veracity of independent scholarship on their parts. Uh, they just saw things differently. Uh, one went by a Roman clock, one went by a Jewish clock, therefore you have different times, and other things that are apparent paradoxes or uh, contradictions. Uh, the ascension going up into heaven, yeah, it's tr uh, Bernie's right. Um, heaven isn't necessarily above, but there's three heavens that are mentioned in the scriptures. And so the picture of heaven that Jesus was presenting was the ascension into the first heaven, which is our atmosphere. The second heaven is, is outer space. The third heaven is in a different dimension. Uh, we have a concept of that. Uh, we were uh, able to conceive of different dimensions, even scientifically, not just science fiction. And so Jesus ended up into another dimension, obviously, which is beyond all of where any of us have been up to now. Uh, counterfeits, uh, he brought up the Mormons, um, he brought up the Catholics uh, with transubstantiation, which is the doctrine of, of the Eucharist becoming um, the real life Jesus. Um, that's where science and logic comes in. Um, and also poetry, I'm into poetry, that is a field I'm comfortable with. 
And I recognize John 6 as a metaphor. Uh, the Catholics, I believe, you know, I respect them. I believe they're true in faith in many ways, uh, many true believers here. But they missed it on that. They missed the metaphor. And because it contradicts the body of Scripture, um, if Jesus was – how could Jesus say, this is my body – uh, about it, and then yet there he was, which was his body, the one that was speaking, or the little wafer that he was holding, or the piece of bread, or whatever. And as far as the kill one another, which was mentioned two or three times by Bernie, uh, there's been plenty of secularists that did that too, and Christians, by and large, were not seconds, crusaders right. or inquisitioners. They were compassionate, loving, Saint or Francis of Assisi type people, Martin Luther's people, that uh, brought love or truth into this world. And so that's what I have to say. <laughs> Bernie, Bernie, that was my alarm clock. Bernie, you're up for three okay, minutes. Okay, yeah, I think uh, Rick brought up the Truth Project. I think that's a project, uh, one thing that is their anti-evolution, and this is something that some of the Christians are saying that, you know, it's, it's really a shame because it's making a mockery of Christianity for these Christians who don't believe in evolution. Um, I just wanted to say that <laughs> The first Christians, you know, if if, if, if you do your research and it finds out, turns out that the first Christians did believe in the real presence of Christ, like Catholics believe today, it's interesting how you say, well, of course that's nonsense, but then, you know, you still say, oh, well, but we've got to still listen to some of the other nonsense, like, you know, the resurrection. Um, you know, I, I think you can dismiss them both on the same grounds of logical thinking. Now, my point about... Christians killing each other wasn't that they're evil because they're killing each other. I was just saying um, that's how the belief systems worked out is where they, they killed their uh, the opposing ideas. I mean, when you had a religious community and somebody else had another idea, they don't say, oh, hey, okay, that's interesting. They say, no, you're a heretic. We'll kill you if you don't leave here. We don't want you corrupting our minds. So it's really difficult to find out what the ancients believed because they were so quick to kill each other in different communities. And I just wanted to bo the bottom line, the reason why I had to leave finally Christianity, the first the first break was evolution, which is a big deal, because that shows that there is no such thing as a first man. That means there's no sin, there's no Adam and Eve and all that. But the, the next thing was, like I said, there's no soul. There's nothing to resurrect. And when you think about the soul, it just becomes nonsense. Because like I said, uh, identical twins, you know, if the soul is giving at conception, it doesn't make sense with identical twins and chimeras. Um, and then, you know, it, uh, people who die in infancy or in senile old age. I mean, just think about those questions. And I know the Christian just puts their brain on hold and says, okay, you know what, someday I'll find out in heaven. That's what they do. But when you think about it, and if you think about it from a naturalistic worldview, it's like, wow, if there is no soul, supernatural soul, and if the mind just emerges from the brain, now all of a sudden it makes sense. What we see is what we get. There's none of these inherent contradictions. So when you have a naturalistic worldview, the, the world comes into clear view and makes sense. But when you have these religious beliefs, you, you just got to say, oh, well, I don't know. Nobody knows. Someday we'll find out in heaven. It's just admit it. They don't, it doesn't work out. And, you know, it's just it's being intellectually honest. Even though it's painful to give up cherished beliefs, you just got to have a devotion to the truth above all else, you know, even if it – even if it disrupts your family or, or whatever. I mean, you, you have to have a devotion to the truth because if you don't, it's going to lead to pain later on, more pain, I believe. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, you're just out of time, Bernie, so that's good. Okay, I'd like to um, remind anyone listening that they are invited to call in and join the discussion. Uh, the telephone number is area code 760-283-5126. That is area code 760-283-5126. Rick, do we have any callers? Not at the moment. I would let you know. Okay. So then the format is to go into the one-minute rapid-fire rebuttal. So, um, Rick, you're up for a minute. Evolution is not science truth, but it's a recent theory with many problems. Uh, nonsense. I will give the evolutionists the benefit of the doubt and the Piltdown Man hoax and many other hoaxes. Um, I won't use that against them to disprove their theory, but it does show that they have their 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 uh, pig's tooth's tooth, uh, like the uh, the farcical Daryl their uh, trials um, 
back in the 1920s. Um, it's not arbitrary to believe and have faith. Uh, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the moral code and the, all of what Christianity has brought to the world uh, by following Jesus, um, this is not arbitrary things. And the Bible is a guide, a psychological guide. That's how I use it as a counselor to how to live. So this is not arbitrary nonsense. There's a lot of substantial history, art, poetry, um, um, science even some, and definitely psychology in the Word of God. I would say okay. that. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. Bernie, one minute. Are you there, Bernie? One minute. Sorry about that. I had mute on. I wonder okay. if I could uh, just list some questions, and Rick can use my time to answer these. But like I said, think about it. How do you explain these things if there's a soul? Like, um, there's supposed to be like an 80% natural miscarriage rate that women have miscarriages and don't even know it. That's a lot of aborted fetuses. And people, when they're senile, when they die, what are they like in heaven, you know? H how do you answer these questions with a soul? Because I'm convinced there is no soul, and that's why there's no such thing as a resurrection. Well, science doesn't answer that question either, but um, taking it from a, a, a biblical uh, mindset, or uh, um, God loves uh, his race. He loves the human race. And those babies are innocents. And they didn't get a chance, whether they were aborted or miscarried, um, they did not get a chance to make it here on earth, uh, those that uh, were not able to. But um, someone who's a senile person or someone who's a little infant or even, you know, inside a fetus baby, a human being, um, which science verifies that, has verified the position that Christians have taken uh, since Roe versus Wade. Um, anyway, uh, the idea there is, is that God is a restorer. He is one who uh, restores people. And so a person who's a little infant, it doesn't mean that there won't be any changes in heaven. That, that, that young child, the innocence, will be able to bloom and blossom in heaven and become a full person uh, retaining that innocence. They won't have okay. all the regrets that have to be washed out of their eyes, so to speak. That's a picture that's given in Revelation. Um, and the senile person will also be able to have a chance to be restored. We see restoration. We see miracles happening here on earth and even natural healings that people experience. So it's not that far of a stretch to see that in heaven. And Time's that up, is right. the picture we have. Okay. Okay, Bernie, another question or a comment? Yeah, just to follow up on that, uh, for example, when a, a, a fetus, there's no such thing as blooming in heaven or blossoming in heaven. Uh, a person becomes who they are based on where they grow up. In other words, if you were born in a poor country or a, rich fam a poor family or a rich family in a different culture, you would become a different person because of the way you emerged. And, you know, if you're a fetus, you're not going to grow up in heaven learning Spanish or English or some other language. The whole thing is nonsense. So basically you are what you are because of the path you went through life. So it's totally nonsense to think somehow you could raise some kind of way in heaven. I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. This is a, there's a, it's a critical concept called emergence, which basically talks about how things emerge and uh, emergence explains how people are and how we come to be. And when you see things from a naturalistic viewpoint like that, everything makes perfect sense. But, I mean, to say that you would bloom and blossom in heaven, I mean, it just makes no sense. You would, you'd have no environment. You'd have nothing specific to shape Time's you. Up. Time's up. Thank you, Bernie. Rick, one minute. I find it incredible that um, that someone who doesn't believe in heaven, Bernie, uh, knows more about heaven than me when he says a statement, no such thing of blooming and blossoming in heaven. That makes no sense. I would like to refer him and also my uh, listeners here to Randy Alcorn's excellent book called Heaven. And Randy was intelligent enough and also humble enough to say that um, 
he could be wrong on a number of these things. He's using, utilizing scripture, but it's really hard to nail it down. But the picture you have is dy- a dynamic wonderfulness and growth in heaven, whereas hell will be a place of stagnation and a place of loneliness. And um, the the soul there will shrink, whereas in heaven it will expand unbelievably. And so it's not a far fetch to see that a person who's, let's say, 35 years old and intelligent and physically strong, but has done a lot of sin, but has been redeemed by the Lamb, will uh, find more purity and more excellence there in heaven and redeem much of what was lost here on earth. And a person who's lost many of their faculties, maybe they uh, experience senility or something of that nature, uh, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, will be also have that ability to be restored because of what God can do. And the same for the fetus. Bernie? Okay, I'll, I'll next talk about, again, about this idea of the soul. I actually got all these info, this ideas, ideas from my Christian conference. Uh, when you consider the case of identical twins, what happens is you have a fertilized egg. So for the first time when the sperm hits the egg, you have a full chromosome set. So you have a full person here. And then that, that you know, cell multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. And um, at some point, it divides into two. So that whole mass divides into two people. And that's why they're identical twins is because their DNA is identical. Now, if you get a soul at conception, this is a big problem because it's like, wow, there was one for the longest time, and now there's two. How the heck did God just say, oh, okay, here, you need another soul? Or did he know this in advance? Of course, God's supposed to know all in advance. So did he give them two souls? Well, it doesn't make sense for one person to have two souls. So none of this makes sense. And so then you say, okay, well, maybe God put a soul in sometime later. Okay, so now you have to figure out, is it at one day? Is it at five days? Is it at three weeks? Is it three months? And it's like, oh, no, okay, it says 45 days. I mean, you're just coming up with, you know, it's random. So that's the, these are kind of the ideas that I'm talking about. When you think about the soul, the more you think about it, the more nonsense it is. Okay, Bernie, thank you. Rick, one minute. Okay, um, I think Bernie's really departed from the topic here, so I'm going to kind of skip over what he had to say and say that Genesis 3 tells us that by Moses, and there's several authors in the Old Testament, Moses being one of them, uh, one of the greatest, he said that there was a seed that will, when, when man fell, that there was a seed that would redeem humankind and that that seed would bruise the heel of the enemy. Then we see in Colossians that at the cross in Colossians 2, that um, the one at the cross, who is obviously Jesus, disarmed principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. We see fulfilled prophecy there. There are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies um, of what Jesus would be doing. And I'll get to some of the uh, resurrection ones here. If I only have a minute, I can't get to all of them now. But... um, but there's a number of those also. So we see um, overwhelming evidence of independent writers through 2,000 years, um, from Job all the way down to the apostles, uh, where we see fulfillment of prophecy. And also, Bernie's incorrect about um, the prophecy of the second coming. Okay, um, I would like to remind anyone listening that they are encouraged to call in. And with your questions or comments, and the number that you would call is area code 760-283-5126, and that is area code 760-283-5126. Call in and join the debate. Um, Gentlemen, we've got about 30 minutes to go, uh, including your two-minute summation. So um, we'll continue with uh, one-minute rebuttals if that's agreeable to you. I would like to suggest, Robert, that we go to two minutes because um, okay. um, the prophetic word, I'd like to address that now. I've already addressed some of the historical without all my points of that, but a little bit of the prophetical, and then that would give Bernie enough time to refute some of those. So if Bernie is well, able to that. Well, you last uh, spoke, so I'd like, to, I'd like to follow up on what you just said last. Oh, of course. Yes, yeah. yeah, that's that's good, Bernie. And then, uh, Bernie, are you agreeable, to, since we don't have a caller, that we might sure. take no, two minutes? Sure, a caller each? just came in, so let's go to the caller here. All right. Well, can, I, that, can, that, I, that, can I 
can I can I make a quick just response first, just thirty seconds or so? Go ahead, Bernie. Okay, so um, the reason why I brought up this thing about the identical twins and everything is because my point is, is that it doesn't make sense to t think about a soul, and if there's no soul, then the whole thing about resurrection doesn't make sense. Um, I, I just think we have the mind that emerged from the brain. That's it. And then the second thing about uh, prophecy is kind of like. That's pretty interesting to think that this was prophesied that Christ would die on the cross because nobody saw that coming. They they never thought their Messiah was going to come and die on the cross. That was a total shocker. Can okay, I have 30 good. seconds to address the twin thing? Just a real quick comment. Yes. Go ahead, Rick. Okay. <laughs> We're indulging. I know. Um, identical twins are not identical. I have um, uh, two grandkids that are identical twins. They are not identical people. They are very different with different personalities, and they have different souls. So that's all I can say on that. Okay. You know, Let's go to the caller. Okay. Let's go to the caller. All right. So we have the caller on. Um, so you are on. Could you give your first name and the um, state that you're calling from? Sure. Uh, this is Jersey. I'm calling from Oregon. Your name is Jersey? Correct. But you're not from Jersey, huh? <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Anyway, uh, Oregon from Jersey or Jersey from Oregon, go ahead and address us uh, with a question, either one of us or to both of us. Sure. So I, I heard a Christian caller call, so I thought maybe I would join in since I'm uh, an atheist. And um, and we're right. specifically talking, you guys are talking specifically about resurrection. So I wanted to ask a couple of questions about the points that were brought up as proof for a resurrection. So the first one was the empty tomb. And to be honest, um, the empty tomb claim is still something that is only a claim because there isn't, there isn't really a historical confirmation that there was a body of Jesus there. To my understanding, there's only writings in the book that say that the tomb was empty. And there isn't anything else that is confirmed by independent scholars or by independent accounts that this is clearly a historical fact. So that's the, that's the first thing. The second one was brought up, which is uh, resurrection experiences. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what it is, if it's hallucinations, if it's uh, hysteria, or if it's really the truth. It's hard to tell. However, it's still only a an account written in a single book. And something like this would have been likely confirmed by independent accounts, independent writers that have no interest, that are not disciples, that are not part of the same Jesus ministry. But something that is truly extraordinary would have been noticed by uh, ancient or, or uh, modern people at that time. So still looking at it, I, I have to say that, you know, I have... I need to uh, remain this, in this belief that this is something that is really true, as a proof. Thank you, Thank you Julie. Stay on the line if you want, if you've got more questions. Um, one I, minute, I have uh, one more thing, but uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Rick, would you like to rebut or start first? Yeah, I'm, I'm flipping through my papers here, <laughs> which uh, makes it difficult. But while I'm doing that, I'm, I'm looking something up here, and I think I just found it. Yeah, I did. But um, I, I don't think it's fair to say there aren't independent accounts just because they're believers. I think if, if something occurred and you are convinced that it occurred, just like evolutionists, uh, they believe in what they believe. And so, you know, just because there's more than one, just three or four, um, just because they all believe in something in a same way doesn't mean that that makes them wrong. I don't think evolutionists are wrong because there's so many of them just because there were – four separate accounts. There wasn't one account. There were four different authors that wrote, and there were uh, 500 witnesses recorded that um, um, recognized that Jesus was alive after he was dead. I don't have time now, but uh, Lee Strobel gives an excellent account, um, uh, quoting from a medical doctor, um, uh, the um, certainty of uh, what took place at the cross would would not just be a swoon, but an actual death of Jesus. Now, another independent account, since uh, this man is asking for that, and that is Josephus, uh, in 20.9, wait a minute, um, I, I missed that. Josephus, uh, who was Jewish and had no, he, he had no um, 
uh, vested interest in Christianity himself in book in Jewish antiquities book 18 chapter 3 paragraph 3 said now there was about this time Jesus a wise man if it be lawful to call him a man for he was a doer of wonderful works a teacher of such men as received the truth of pleasure he drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles he was uh, claimed to be the Christ and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. This was okay, written by up, a Rick. man. Okay. okay. Time's up, Rick. Okay, I gave Rick two minutes. Uh, uh, Bernie, take two Can minutes. Can I respond to that? And then Jersey will have you on right after Rick, or right, right after uh. Bernie. Okay, yeah. The, I, I'm surprised uh, Rick mentioned that from Josephus. I think even the conservative seminaries will tell you that that part is a known forgery uh, addition, that part that he quoted. Uh, there's, there's two parts. I think one part is really brief, and the second part is the embellishment. I think that's the well-known part that he quoted that is an embellishment. It's, so, I mean, in, uh, even the conservative scholars would say that was uh, that's, uh, that's a scam, basically. Um, and Rick again mentioned evolution. I was saying that's based on evidence, not on testimonies or anything. These, he says there's these four authors. Well, again, nobody knows who wrote these things. And he says 500 people appeared. Uh, Jesus appeared to 500. Who are they? Peter, I mean, Paul just mentioned them. He didn't get any way to check it at all. And uh, Lee Strobel talks about a, a medical doctor who, who would have said what happened at the execution. That's all hearsay. I mean, imagine this take, took place. Here's how it would have happened. That's all he's saying. It doesn't. It doesn't add anything at all to the facts at hand or anything about the history. Okay. Thank you, Bernie. Yep. Jersey, did you have another question? Um, I just had a response to to what um, I think Rick was saying um, in terms of the independent account. Uh, notwithstanding what Bernie uh, said, I want to just say that what, what Josephus was saying is basically that there were people who were claiming these things and then maybe there was a man who existed and who did wonderful things that still doesn't prove that he res was resurrected and then doesn't prove that he exists somewhere. And then that's really my other question is I, I can't understand this claim. This is a very modern claim because Asians did not have that concept of multiple dimensions this modern claim uh, of Jesus existing now and existing in a different dimension. I mean, the uh, basic question is, what proof do you have that there is another dimension? And what, what makes you say that he exists in there? And w what is the base for this belief you know, in terms of the facts? Okay, um, Rick? When okay. You... Um. So Bernie called Josephus a forgery, um, or he said a lot of people are saying that. Where's the proof? Um, what conservative people? Uh, start naming a list of them. Um, the medical doctor is hearsay. If he was an evolutionist and he said that the resurrection never happened or the death never happened, would that then make him more palatable to the Jesus Seminar group that's a radical anti-Christian intellectual group? Were Paul of Tarsus, Corey Timboom, Justice Martyr, John Piper, Johann Gutenberg, Ignatius of Antioch, William Wilberforce, Alexander Solonsensky, C.S. Lewis, Anne Hutchinson, Augustine, Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, Theodore Dostoevsky, uh, John the Cross, El Elizabeth Elliot, Dwight Moody, John Wycliffe, and Francis Assisi, all wrong. But Jersey and Bernie are right. That's time. Um, Bernie. Um, I think one thing uh, Rick might find interesting is if you read C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, the last chapter is called The New Men, and he talks about evolution as an analogy uh, for the gospel. So C.S. Lewis obviously didn't have a problem with evolution, and not only that, but he used evolution as a, a really neat analogy, so uh, that I think you'll find that cause that's pretty funny. I think. Well, my comment to that is that 
C.S. Lewis might be a good bridge to the gospel for you then. It's true. C.S. Lewis did not have all the conventional views of a conservative Christian, but he did believe in the resurrection. So I don't know what to do with that. Jersey, if you're oh. still with us, I'll let you have yeah, one more maybe I can, question. I can comment on that. That was a long list of names, um, and I appreciate you doing the research. But I do want to point out that these great minds are um, people who are people of their times. And at certain times it was, I would say, dangerous to your life not to believe or even, to, or even profess to not believe in God. Many of the scholars separated their work on science from their beliefs. And the great work they did had nothing to do with metaphysical, but everything to do with physical work. And, you know, Newton didn't pray for calculus. Copernicus was afraid to publish his work because of the threats uh, on the, uh, that, that he would uh, objections from the religious people that he would get and potentially death threats. So uh, I think people who do great work are great minds, but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't separate their beliefs from what actually they do in terms of the reality. So I, I'm not impressed by the list. I understand there are plenty of very smart people who are believers, and I am very respectful of that. However, the beliefs are traditional, and they come from where people are born, uh, because it's great science work was done by the Muslim world until the Mullahs put, put basically a stopper to that in, in the 6th century. And that's not only the Christian invention science, but also a number of other societies and civilizations had great science. Thank you, Jersey, for joining us. I'd like to remind um, other callers or other listeners that we, they can call in and are encouraged to do so at area code 760-283-5126. That is area code 760-283-5126. Call in and join the debate. Um, Rick, one minute. All right. Um, I guess to Jersey, uh, Corey Timblum, Solzhenitsyn, and Elizabeth Elliott, who are modern figures, uh, of the 20th century, all paid a dear price for their faith in the resurrection of Christ. They were persecuted, and um, uh, Elizabeth Elliot's husband lost his life. Elizabeth Elliot, uh, Jim Elliot, Elizabeth Elliot made great sacrifices. Corey Timbone lost his sis her sister's life in a uh, Nazi concentration camp. Solonsensky, we know his story, and another one. So. There's many great believers that, no, they did not have the popular uh, point of view, and they had to suffer for it. Another um, prophecy, because I think that kind of gets back to our main point, is that there's been prophecies, but I don't want to use up more than my minute, so I'll catch it on another minute if I get an opportunity. Or maybe Bernie? we can expand it. Yeah, uh, Jersey kind of started the question with um, – what evidence is there of, of another dimension, and how do you know Jesus is in there? Uh, I would imagine that um, Rick might have answered, uh, well, you know, I just feel it. I just know, I, I know Jesus is alive because I, I feel the relationship with him. So I just want to reiterate how feelings cannot determine the, the truth of Jesus' existence at all, not in any way, shape, or form. Um, then he talked, uh, Rick mentioned about those persecuted for their faith. You know, so what? There's Mormons and Muslims who also give their life for their faith and of course you think the mormon theology is all messed up nonsense and you know like and also the the muslim uh theology is messed up nonsense i mean the muslims reject jesus as god so and, and you know that he rose from the dead and all that so um you know being persecuted for your faith means nothing compared you know in regards to knowing the truth it means nothing whatsoever. It just means somebody has strong conviction. So what? Okay, gentlemen, we've got um, 13 minutes before your two-minute summation. Um, I'll mention one more time, if there's anyone listening that would like to join the debate, that they can call in at area code 760-283-5126. That is area code 760-283-5126. And unless I hear, unless it's unanimous between the two of you, we're going to stick with the one-minute rebuttal. So, Rick, go ahead. You're next. All right. I could do a quick one on the um, failed prophecy because uh, that is a good, strong argument of atheists. And I'd say that uh, for dispensational Christians, uh, uh, they pretty much triumph in that argument. But there are many Christians, and I'm not saying what position I take, but many Christians 
of a reformed theology, for instance, that take a different position. There's many different positions, and some say that either in some sense or in many senses, whatever, Jesus did return in A.D. 70. He predicted he would. He said that he would. And also he talked about the destruction of the temple at that time. And yes, there are many prophecies. I agree with Bernie on that. I think he makes a good point, and it's a strong argument. But the answer is is that it was fulfilled either partially or fully or however we want to say it. I want to get into theology here. But um, there was a type of that return that occurred. And yes, uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, 28, I don't have it in front of me, but it states it rather clearly. Actually, if I have time, I'll get that out because maybe that's something that Bernie would want me to. Let's, um, let's let Bernie rebut and then you can bring it up next. Okay, Bernie? Yeah, I mean, you admit that uh, theologians have to argue. They have to argue about the return of Christ. Some say... Um, they're called preterists, that Jesus already returned. Why? Well, because the temple was uh, destroyed, and it had to do with the temple and all that stuff, and the temple being rebuilt and all these things. But anyway, uh, some of, so basically they argue about whether Jesus really returned or not. I mean, why is there problems in theology? It's because the Bible is all murky, and it's exactly <laughs> what you would expect if you had different people writing different things, and now you're trying to say that it's one monolithic story. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are not one monolithic story. There are, there are when you look at the gospel and try to reconcile, especially the uh, resurrection, what happened, they have inconsistencies that cannot be worked out. In other words, like when Jesus resurrected, did he tell them to go to Galilee, or did he say stay in Jerusalem? Because it's two different stories. Uh, there, there are contradictions. Okay, Rick. And so that's, that's just one obvious contradiction. Rick, one minute. Uh, the Bible, Murky, I 100% agree with uh, Bernie. Jesus himself said that to the unbeliever, the Bible is murky and that it can only be spiritually discerned. So to an unbeliever, yes, it is foolishness to the unbeliever. I agree with him. Psalm 2, verses 1 to 2, 7 to 8. Why do the heathen rage and the people devise a vain thing. This is David, not Moses, another prophet. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers against uh, uh, the Lord and against his anointed, saying, um, and uh, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said to me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Okay, prophecy. Fulfillment, Acts chapter 13. And though they found no cause for death in, in him, yet they asked Pilate that they should that he should be slain, and so forth. And it says, but God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days. Uh, this was the fulfillment of that prophecy in Acts chapter 2, that there would be a resurrection. Bernie, <clears throat> one minute. Okay, so, um, yeah, I mean, that's really funny that uh, Rick would say these things have to be spiritually discerned. And so, okay, so who's the one spiritually discerning it correct? Is it the Baptists or is it the Catholics or is it the Mormons? You know, that, that was, that's kind of a joke. They have to be spiritually discerned. This is what all the, the Christian groups, these born-again Christians, they, they start their own church at the drop of a hat without even being formally educated. And, you know, how can you do that? Oh, because the Spirit of God is upon me, and the Spirit teaches me we have no need for man's wisdom and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, that, that, that is, that's pretty amazing to say these things are spiritually discerned, therefore don't even talk to a, a non-believer. And by the way, you can say that I never believed, but some other Christians deal with me by saying, oh, you know what, I'm a backslider. So, you know, you can have it either way. Some people... People who know me, they would never say that I was never a Christian because they know how I gave my life for Jesus, how I uh, did everything. I mean, even was going to start a church. Uh, I've, I've done so much for Jesus, but now I see it as a delusion. So um, I'll just leave Time's it there, up. I guess, for now. Time's up, Rick. Disagreements, yes. Uh, Christians don't always behave themselves. Um there's a rule of thumb, unity in the essentials. There's an amazing amount of unity among Christians. It's called koinonia. I feel that fellowship. Um, uh, I won't mention this denomination, but I'll say that my friend Robert comes from a totally different um, background or tradition than I do. But in the spirit, we come together in unity. Don't we, brother? Yes. Yes, we okay. do. Okay, we do. 
but diversity and liberty and the non-essentials. He, he and I, we can debate ourselves and pick up points, but on the essentials of the faith, there's that unity. And then there's charity in everything, and that's where some Christians miss it. And shame on them. Shame on them. We should be able to disagree in a friendly way. We believe in diversity in the church very much, but there's a unity on the essentials, which is, by the way, love, which he said it doesn't have much to do with truth, but love and truth are actually the essentials of the Bible. Next oh, time. and I left out part of that. Oh, go ahead. Bernie, Bernie, go ahead. Um. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. That's you. You have an interesting theology there about uh, love and unity, or however you specify that. I, I, I know that saying. Uh, it's been a while, but that's an interesting theology. That's a little different theology than other people. Um, you know, some of the some of the Catholics and Protestants have different theology about uh, truth above all, and they kill each other. Uh, for, you know, they're heretics. <laughs> so. You know, I guess uh, you, since you since you can spiritually discern things, I think you you must think that you have a higher theology closer to God than they did. Um, so I mean, yeah, everybody's got, everybody's got their own spiritual discernment. So <laughs> oh, that's good. Thank you, thank you, Bernie. Um, um, Rick, one uh, minute. Robert. Um, I'm looking at our time because we do need a little bit of closing time. So I think we need to go to our summations. I'll let him have the last word there. And, you know, there's plenty of other prophecies, but they'll, they'll be for another day, I guess, or maybe. But uh, All right. I think two minutes each. Mm-hmm. Um, Bernie, do you want to make your summation statement then for two minutes? Yeah, I could do that. All right. Go right ahead. Okay, I'm just going to uh, reiterate my six points because I think they're really interesting points and it's good for people to hear them again. Uh, the first one is that I want you to uh, – a lot of Christians say no matter what, I know that you know the resurrection is true because I just have a relationship with Jesus in my heart. And I want to reiterate, I know that feeling and I believe it's a delusion. And it's actually a logical fallacy that you can discern truth through feelings. It's called the appeal to emotion. Um, so just as you know, a Mormon can't decide the truth of the Book of Mormon through feelings, you know, you, you can't do the same thing about the resurrection. Uh, the second thing is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. When somebody says, here's a really wild claim, and plus you have to reorientate your whole life because of it, uh, you should really ask for extra evidence to support that. The third one is uh, the thing about the resurrection. It's a historical claim, so you should treat it as any other historical thing. Don't give it special credence just because you grew up in a Christian country or a Christian family. You know, you need to know things like the Gospels are anonymously written. Uh, you know, people in church don't know that. They think it was really ri- the Gospels were really written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but nobody knows. That's the truth. There's nothing. The next point is, number four, there's nothing to resurrect. We have the mind that emerges from the brain. There is no such thing as a soul. And I gave a bunch of illustrations to talk about that, you know, like uh, chimeras and identical twins and infants that die and senile people that die, etc. If you have a naturalistic worldview, it all makes sense. Uh, number five, it's hard to historically uh, evaluate a miracle because it could be a magician or whatever, and there's nothing to be reproduced. And even people today say they see Jesus and things like that. And number six, the prophecies... Uh, nobody prophesied Jesus was going to die on the cross, that he was going to be a Messiah, that kind of Messiah. And then the most famous failed prophecy of all is the soon return of Christ. It's all over the, God, it's all over the Gospels, all over the, the Bible, and it's been 2,000 years and going. Jesus is not going to return because uh, he's no longer here. If he ever was a person, he's no longer here now. The person that is in the Gospels is, it could be based on a real person, but it's mostly all myth. And every religion has their own myth. You know, the, the Greeks had their own myth, Greek mythology, Hindu mythology, Norse mythology. This is just Christian mythology. And I suggest calling it Christian mythology instead of Christian theology. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, Rick, your summation? Two minutes? In the words of Alexander Solonitskitsyn, I can't say his name, over a half century ago, while I was still a child, I recall hearing a number of old people offer the following explanation for the great disasters that has befallen Russia. Men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. 
Since then, I have spent well nigh 50 years working on the history of our revolution. In the process, I have read hundreds of books, collected hundreds of personal testimonies, and have already contributed eight volumes of my own toward the effort of clearing away the rubble left by that upheaval. But if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million of our people, I could not put it more accurately than to repeat, men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. I think a man that has suffered and has the intellectual esteem that a man like Alexander Solonzinski has, um, I think states it very well, and um, it's a fitting conclusion to what I have to say. Thank you, gentlemen, for the very interesting...